Well, I'm grateful for the uh, kind introduction and for the opportunity to make uh, this presentation. Uh, I want to um, uh, note <coughs> that the presentation is, as uh, Professor Fry pointed out, uh, inspired by the theme that he had in mind when he created the uh, a Turning of the Wheel, a Humanities Exploration uh, Series. Uh, the theme as I understood it uh, uh, contained elements of interplay between uh, the universality of uh, community and the uh, unique aspects of individuals and segments within a community. And it occurred to me that there are uh, counterpart interplays uh, in uh, jurisprudence. For example, uh, we cope uh, uh, in our thinking about law and justice uh, with tensions between uniformity and diversity in the content of the law. Uh, we deal with uh, tensions between having the law articulated and uh, administered by experts and uh, the populist uh, notion of individual citizen participation in enunciating uh, uh, decisions under the law represented, of course, most uh, prominently by the American jury. Uh, we deal with issues of centralized authority and dispersion of authority, which lies at the heart of our federal system, which Justice Brandeis once called a great laboratory uh, for innovation, in which the states were the engines of uh, innovation. And we also deal uh, quite explicitly with uh, Professor Fry's notion of community values on the one hand and individual autonomy or rights on the other. Uh, we also have other tensions with which we deal, uh, finality versus fairness in disputes. It may very well be that, uh, that in commercial disputes, for example, it's more important to get a decision and know what the rule is so people can accommodate to it than to uh, engage in protracted dispute resolution or even litigation. But on the other hand, if the issue is life or death in a capital case, uh, finality may have to take a backseat to fairness. We also see that when uh, law intersects with uh, economics, as I'm uh, going to mention presently, uh, there are goals of efficiency, but there are also goals of equity. Uh, a century and a half ago, uh, the British essayist uh, and, and poet, George Eliot, uh, posed a question. The question was, what is justice? And then answering her own, yes, her own, uh, question said, justice is like the kingdom of God. It is not without us as a fact, it is within us as a great yearning. Well, this affair of the heart uh, with uh, justice uh, is coupled over time with intellectual, you might say, uh, precepts of how justice should be delivered and how it should be shaped. And so I'm going to uh, attempt in the next uh, few minutes of this presentation uh, to give you a history at a glance of Western jurisprudence. Uh, at law school, we would charge you a lot of money and take a whole semester to do this, but you're going to get it for free in about five minutes. Uh, we start uh, in the early days of, um, of Western uh, jurisprudence. By that, I mean Eurocentric uh, jurisprudence with the idea of natural law. Natural law uh, was a mixture of antiquity, drawing largely uh, from um, uh, Greek civilization and writings, from early Christian doctrine, and uh, from local custom. Uh, in, the old, in the days of uh, early uh, England, after the Norman invasion uh, and the Norman uh, conquest, a very sensible thing was done, and that was to leave local custom alone, except insofar as it might be uh, uh, contradicted by uh, edicts uh, from the crown, which were relatively few and not easily uh, communicated. And so there was plenty of room for evolution uh, at uh, the uh, local level, but it was all uh, tied together with ideas of immutable principles that is, recourse to some underlying set of enduring principles that would give coherence to this otherwise decentralized and almost village-centric uh, system of justice. In Blackstone's commentaries, uh, Blackstone being one of the early writers, and some of you recognize that name, uh, he looked back on that period, and he said, 
uh, and this will be in patriarchal language uh, customary at the time, considering the creator only as a being of infinite power, he was able unquestionably to have prescribed whatever laws he pleased to his creature, man. He had laid down only such laws as were founded in relations of justice that existed in the nature of things antecedent to any positive, that is, human-made precept. These are the eternal, immutable laws of good and evil, to which the Creator himself in all dispensations conforms, and he has enabled human reason to discover so far as they are necessary for the conduct of human actions. Uh, not long after that, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, famous figure and uh, uh, kind of a bridge figure between uh, uh, the early days of the common law and uh, the culture of the time and uh, the subsequent movement toward positive, that is, human-centric law, said this, rational creatures are subject in divine providence in a very special way, being themselves made participants in providence itself imparting that human beings have the ability to exercise some of the rationality and spirit of the Creator. In that they, human beings, control their own actions and the actions of others, so they have a certain share of divine reason itself, deriving therefrom a natural inclination to such actions and ends as are fitting. This participation in the eternal law by rational creatures is called the natural law. Judges in those days were viewed as the oracles of the law. You may know what I mean by an oracle, a speaking tube almost, from which uh, uh, some external source of wisdom uh, emanates. And the emphasis in this view of law, spoken through the oracles of the law, uh, placed a good deal of emphasis, as you might imagine, on uniformity and on expertise. After all, these are the, uh, uh, the individuals who are uh, expected in our society to enunciate eternal principles. There was only such a disper dispersion of authority and articulation of individual rights as could be consistent with this overall framework of neutral principles and enduring principles. Now comes a change. In the Industrial Revolution and the uh, uh, years that immediately followed, there is the rise of utilitarianism and the rise of positive law, the human-centric law. Thomas Hobbes is uh, best known, as you know, for saying that life is nasty, brutish, and short, but in his uh, writing about the Leviathan, uh, the structure of society and government, he actually implied that human beings can create uh, and, and affect their own destiny, which was a very liberating idea, not entirely consistent with the notion of eternal principles. Uh, he. Uh, was echoed uh, in this regard uh, by uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, who uh, said, in addition to what I quoted him earlier, saying that the rule and measure of human action is reason. Remember, he thought that reason partook of the divine uh, spirit, which is the first principle of human action. It is reason which directs action to its appropriate end. The law must have as its proper object the well-being of the whole community. So now we have an emphasis on uh, maximizing the benefits to the community, and Jeremy Bentham stepped into that uh, intellectual heritage. Uh, Bentham has been called l'enfant terrible of the uh, common law, uh, the terrible infant, uh, the, 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 the person who elbowed his way in and thought so much of himself that he later had his body stuffed so it could be sitting at a dining hall at Cambridge University and greet all those who came after him. Uh, Bentham postulated that law should not be shaped by eternal principles, but should be shaped by its social usefulness. He characterized life as an, as an ongoing struggle between pain and pleasure. And the idea of law and of government uh, shaped by law should be to maximize in the aggregate sense pleasure over pain, and of course he was using that in a, in a very broad sense, not simply physical pleasure over physical pain, and that the maximization of pleasure over pain was the measure of social usefulness and the measure of whether a law was just or not. Law would be judged by its utility. Uh, 
John Stuart Mill had some difficulties with that. He said that although he considered utilitarianism to be the ultimate call of the law and the utility or social usefulness, usefulness of the law as its uh, ultimate criterion, nevertheless it ought to be subject to permanent interests of humankind, of which he included individual liberty and individual autonomy. And so now you have entering into this sequence of, of, of thought. Uh, the idea that there are community values, there are also underlying eternal principles, but these are being questioned by human-centric or positive law, and into that intellectual heritage steps John Austin, uh, who viewed law entirely from a positive, that is, human-based perspective, not ecclesiastical, not with respect to eternal principles, and he even took the idea of utilitarianism beyond its shape and suggested that really, in human-made or positive law, law is only an enforceable command. It has no moral footing, it has, no necess it has necessarily no uh, moral direction, uh, it is contentless, except insofar as it is enforceable. Well, this idea, in the 19th century, gave rise in the late part of the century, in the early 20th century, <coughs> to what has come, come to be called, uh, somewhat in retrospect, sociological uh, jurisprudence, viewing the law as a process <coughs> rather than as a set of immutable principles. <coughs> Oliver Wendell Holmes, uh, famous justice of the, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., famous justice of the uh, U U.S. Supreme Court in the 19th century, took issue with something that uh, more than a century before Lord Cook of England had said. Lord Cook had said um, that reason was the life of the law. Holmes did not agree. Holmes wrote in The Path of the Law, the life of the law has not been logic, it has been experience. The felt necessities of the time, the prevalent moral and political theories, in intuitions of public policy, avowed or unconscious, even the prejudices, which judges share with their fellow men have had a good deal more to do than the syllogism in determining the rules by which men should be governed. The substance of the law at any given time is pretty nearly corresponding to what is then understood to be convenient. So you can see that the, um, <clears throat> the evolution here from eternal principles through positivism and now uh, viewing the law only as a, uh, as a process um, is uh, sh reshaping ideas about the law. And indeed, Louis Brandeis, uh, uh, who later became one of the great justices of the Supreme Court in the 20th century, became famous for introducing sociological and economic data into legal briefs submitted to courts as though they were going to decide uh, legal questions. And these types of briefs came to be known famously, as many of you know, as Brandeis briefs. Um, Another great giant of the, of the law in the early 20th century, Benjamin Cardozo, uh, fully approved of that approach to the law and said the law bends to social and economic needs. And a, and a school of thought that, that emanated from that was the realist who said, if you look at uh, judicial decisions, what the judges say is not always what they mean. They're just giving a formalistic gloss to something that arises from underlying social or economic uh, forces or maybe emanates uh, from their own uh, personal prejudices. Indeed, at the time the realists were asserting their uh, role in American jurisprudence, there was realism in other parts of, uh, in other disciplines, such as literature and in popular literature. You all remember the famous scene in The Wizard of Oz when Toto goes around uh, within the Green Palace and pulls back the curtain to show that, that the wizard is really just an ordinary man. Uh, uh, attempting to give the appearance of great authority and wisdom. Well, the realists thought that judges were kind of like that. They just have a lot of trappings of authority and wisdom, but they are just ordinary people expressing prejudices and conveniences. Pretty dim view of the law. Well, several things happened. One that actually uh, anteceded the 20th century, it was antecedent to the 20th century, was the great Civil War in the United States. People like Holmes were devastated by that. Can you imagine a very substantial fraction of the population of the country dying 
in an internal war. Is that what lawlessness, is that what personal convenience means? Could not the law have done something about that? And then we have uh, the rise of totalitarianism, the fascist regimes, uh, both of Europe and of Asia during the 20th century. Um, and we have the Holocaust uh, with its total abdication of notions of any eternal principles of justice uh, or of um, uh, uh, sanctity of individual life. And so we had again a juxtaposition of the rule of law against the rule of the powerful and the positivists and the sociological jurisprudence advocates and the realists came rather abruptly up against some lessons of history that if law is only what the powerful make it, there will not be justice. In that context, there was in the mid 20th century and perhaps right after World War II, a reaffirmation of something very innate to the great American experiment. The great American experiment is not democracy, it existed uh, before uh, the Declaration of Independence, let alone the Constitution. And the great American experiment was not even a republic, that is, a democratic process involving representatives. That existed, albeit imperfectly, in England as well. The idea that the great American experiment, the original source of American exceptionalism, if you like that phrase, is the constitutional republic. The idea that a charter can actually govern and control the impulses of society and that only extraordinary majorities can change the terms of the charter. But otherwise, the popular impulse of the moment will be constrained by certain principles laid down in the chartering document. The American Constitution actually addressed two of the great causes of tyranny. One was the tyranny of the few over the many, undue concentration of power, which was addressed by horizontally spreading government across three branches and then vertically spreading it over several levels of government, each of which had its own branches of government. But it also addressed the other great form of tyranny, the tyranny of the many over the few, the tyranny of the majority, by enunciating in the Bill of Rights adopted concurrently with the Constitution certain rights that even a majority of the day cannot take away. Uh, this idea that there are certain rights that even a majority of the day cannot take away was reflected in the post-World War II war crimes tribunals uh, in which uh, universal uh, human rights be began to get uh, uh, their voice and in which uh, uh, war criminals were tried according to universal principles and could not simply have recourse to the national law under which they had carried out murderous uh, intentions. Uh, Herman Wexler, uh, uh, who uh, had his professional start as an assistant to one of the courts in the whole array of uh, post-World War II war crimes tribunals, later went on to a professorship at Harvard and enunciated the idea that we need to recapture neutral principles, such as freedom of, of discrimination, which would be very close to Mill's idea of permanent interest. And we should ad adopt those as universal and correspond our policies and our interpretation of the Constitution accordingly. Another movement looking again for neutral and enduring principles uh, arose in what we call law and economics. The idea that there are certain uh, elements of, uh, of interaction and laws, if you will, of the consequences of economic uh, activity uh, which should be recognized and uh, built into uh, a matrix of judicial decisions uh, whenever disputes arise. Well, what are some of the characteristics of enduring um, principles? One of them uh, seems to be that they provide consistent guidance across time and across issues. They are not result oriented. They can be applied from case to case to case. They are not rationalizations for a preferred outcome in a particular case. 
the general public doesn't always understand that. They think the judges with black robes can just do anything they want, and that's what judicial independence means. But that's not what judicial independence means. Independence means freedom to abide by the law, notwithstanding popular impulses at a given time. When high school students go through mock trials, for example, it's unfortunate that the students will go through quite a rigorous process of digesting a record and formulating arguments and, and trial pra practice uh, uh, stratagems, uh, as, as lawyers might. But then, at the end, some of the high school students who get to be judges just get to say whatever they want. And they get the impression that that's what judges really do. So I, unfortunately, as you can see, I think mock trials actually teach a bad civics lesson, at least with respect to the judicial function. Uh, enduring principles are grounded in shared and stable, but not necessarily static values. There is it's such a thing as history, such a thing as process. The sociological jurisprudence advocates were right about that. But law doesn't change from year to year or uh, from, uh, even from generation to generation quickly. It proceeds slowly enough to be stable, even if it is not static. These enduring principles articulate uh, individual and community interests and try to uh, harmonize them. They allow for some play in the joints in the structure of the law uh, so that there can be peaceful change, that there can be incremental changes as circumstances arise. And in fact, the, the uh, Anglo-American common law has sometimes been called a moving classification system because of its ability to absorb and to adapt uh, to changes over a very long period of time. Some people even think that the Industrial Revolution moved faster in the Anglo-American legal system than in the old continental system, which was very rules-based uh, in Europe, simply because the common law system, although not very efficient because it would keep relitigating things, allowed in each iter iteration of litigation a fresh look at, uh, at cases in light of changing circumstances, and that allowed the law to be a little more commodious with respect to the forces of economic growth. Uh, none of these uh, historic schools of jurisprudence, though, the natural law, purely positive law, the interim school of utilitarianism, sociological and realistic jurisprudence, and the later search uh, for um, uh, neutral principles, none of these perfectly exhibits all of the characteristics that I have said. And so that is why we call the pursuit of justice that, rather than the achievement of justice. We are always striving for something that cannot quite be reached. It's almost asymptotic. You get closer, but you never quite arrive. Now let me give it, uh, some illustrations of how differing viewpoints about what the principle should be uh, can affect our view about the outcome of disputes and cases. Um, I'm going to take two different pathways here. One of them is to talk briefly comparing and contrasting some principles in the regulation of public professions. And I'm going to choose law and the judiciary on one hand and uh, uh, journalism on another. <clears throat> and then later I'm going to turn back to the law and economics movement. The sources uh, of uh, uh, these principles can be found in the model code of judicial conduct for judges, in the model rules of professional conduct for lawyers, both of which have been uh, advanced by the American Bar Association, and from two sources, I realize there may be more than two, uh, from the Society of Professional Journalists and the American Society of Newspaper Editors, well known as ASNE. Let's look at these in four different contexts. Um, one of them, there's those sources. You have to remind me to hit the button once in a while. And now let's look at these contexts. Let's think about the truth-seeking idea. Is that an enduring principle, which, shared, which is shared across disciplines? We'll look at holding public authority ac accountable. We'll look at affirming the dignity and rights of individuals and take a quick look at the principle of impartiality. With respect to truth-seeking, I'll suggest that there is a close convergence between law and the judiciary on the one hand and journalism on the other. The ASNE uh, statement of ethics includes the uh, statement that every effort must be made to assure that news content is accurate, that all sides are presented fairly, significant errors of fact as well as errors of omission should be corrected promptly and prominently, 
and the Society of Professional Journalists as that uh, we should test the accuracy of information from all sources, making certain that headlines, news teasers, et cetera, do not uh, misrepresent uh, the underlying content of the news. Similarly, uh, with respect to ABA ethical precepts to judges and lawyers, a judge is expected to uh, uphold and apply the law and not to be swayed by public clamor or fear of criticism. Find the fact, apply the law, withstand popular pressure uh, to do otherwise. And lawyers are um, uh, instructed under the ABA model rules, although you won't see this very much in popular culture, not to knowingly make any false statement of fact or law to a tribunal or fail to correct a false statement or fail to disclose a material fact. And they must avoid assisting in a crime or fraud. Now, late night television and so on is full of assisting crimes or frauds and misrepresenting. That's, that's uh, the difference between entertainment and the real world that we teach lawyers to inhabit. So there is a broad sense of commonality uh, there. And so we might say that principle of truth seeking is enduring and shared. With respect to holding public accountable authority accountable, there may be a little difference here. Um, journalism is, uh, is uh, adjured to bring an independent scrutiny to bear on forces of power in society, including the conduct of official power. Judges expressing their independence must act at all times that promotes public confidence in the independence, integrity, and impartiality of the judiciary. Interestingly enough, with respect to lawyers, Lawyers have a more nuanced set of responsibilities. In the preamble to the model rules of uh, professional conduct, lawyers are uh, instructed that they have three roles to play. One of them is to be uh, a representative of clients, but exercising independent professional judgment, not just letting the client dictate what's going to be done. It is, after all, the lawyer's ethics account, not the client's ethics. Secondly, uh, that the lawyer is an officer of the legal system, charged with making sure that the system does operate correctly. The lawyer is not a revolutionary uh, throwing bombs at the system. Uh, finally, the officer, uh, the, the lawyer uh, in the United States is a public citizen with a special responsibility for the quality of justice. Now think of that. In other professions such as medicine or veterinary medicine or architecture, no individual practitioner is charged with responsibility for making sure that the entire profession delivers to the public good. And in other parts of the world, lawyers do not have that responsibility, but the American lawyer does have that responsibility. Those three roles, representative of the client, but with independent judgment, officer of the legal system, and a public citizen with responsibility for the quality of justice, mean that the lawyer cannot always be inveighing against the system. Rather, the lawyer tries to achieve justice while affirming the value of having a, a legal system. And so we would say with respect to holding public authority accountable that there is a broad sharing of that as an enduring principle, but there are some nuances based upon the roles that professionals play. With respect to affirming the dignity and rights of individuals, there may be a divergence here. Maybe it's in, more in practice than in theory. <laughs> Journalists are told to minimize harm to show compassion for those who might be adversely affected by the news gathering or news reporting process. Judges are told they must ac accord to every person the right to be heard according to law. Prosecutors are told that they must refrain. There's a rule on this, it's rule 3.8 uh, of the model rules, refrain from heightening public condemnation of the accused. And the rules applying to all lawyers say that they shall not use means that have no substantial purpose other to embarrass, delay, or burden a third person nor engage in any conduct prejudicial to the administration of justice. That's a fairly tight set of constraints and they do not have an exact counterpart in journalism. Indeed, uh, anybody who uh, looks at uh, television coverage of the work of the courts and sees the so-called perp walk uh, that's a, the photograph of a person who has been taken into custody and is walking into the courthouse. That person is shown as a guilty person. That's the visual, that's the optic of it, even though the person is only accused and presumptively innocent. 
So we do have a divergence in the way in which we look at that issue. Finally, with regard to dignity and rights of the individuals, or rather with respect to impartiality, um, we have, I think, a more closely shared value. Journalists uh, uh, are told that uh, the, the press does not have to be unquestioning or to refrain from editorial expression, but we do tell judges that they will disqualify themselves in any proceeding in which their impartiality might reasonably be questioned. And lawyers are told that, that their representation of an individual to provide access to justice does not mean that they subscribe to the underlying views uh, of their clients. Their, their job is simply to exercise professional judgment. And so even though there is a shared value about impartiality, there is some role differentiation and indeed I may uh, not be going too far to say that in both professions there are those who question whether objectivity and whether uh, impartiality is a genuine goal or is even genuinely achievable. So it's a struggle to come up with enduring uh, principles. Let's take another uh, look and this time at the, uh, the world of law and economics. And again, there's a whole course on this, but you're going to get it in a few minutes. There are certain basic assumptions made by economists looking at how the world works, and this will be very sim uh, simple and therefore simplistic. But economists assume that most people are rationally self-maximizing in behavior. They try to use Bentham's phrase to maximize a pleasure in all of its uh, dimensions over pain. And they, the individuals, have what are called exogenous preferences. That means they, they have preferences that don't arise from the marketplace itself, but they either have by birth or by upbringing certain preferences of things they like and things they don't like. They are exogenous to the market, but people come to the market with these preferences in mind. And they make bargained exchanges with others who have different uh, uh, exogenous preferences. This happens all the time. If you stop at a Coke machine out here, a soft, soft drink machine, and if you put a dollar and ten cents into the machine and you get a bottle of soda back, you've made an exchange. You have said, I would rather have that bottle of, of uh, soda uh, than I would rather have the dollar and ten cents. And somebody on the other side has said, I'd rather have your dollar and ten cents than to keep this bottle of soda that I put in the machine. So you have different preferences. You make an exchange and you both are better off. You're both happier as a result of that. And in a competitive market where there are many suppliers and many consumers of goods and services, we assume that the prices at which these exchanges take place are pretty well correlated with the cost of these goods and services. Uh, when that is true, and when people make knowledgeable exchanges on things where the costs and the prices are, about the, are, are well uh, uh, aligned with each other, then we have what economists call efficiency we have a maximization of the total wealth of the society. However, if there are things that can affect the cost without also affecting prices at which uh, goods and services are traded in the market, then we can't be assured that these exchanges are resulting in a true efficiency, a true optimality. And one of these uh, areas uh, of uh, difficulty in market theory is what we call the externality. Here's an illustration of what I mean by an externality. Imagine, if you would, a two-person world consisting of a farmer and a fisherman. They, in this little world, are geographically proximate to each other. The farmer, uh, and this is my hypothetical after all, uh, uh, finds that there is some technology in which she can uh, invest a certain amount of money and receive an even higher yield on the crop. And there, there's a net profit that comes from that. So she does that. The next year, the fisherman notices there are fewer fish in the stream and figures out it's because of the runoff from the technologically enriched uh, fertilizer that the farmer put on her field. So now what, what should happen? It may very well be that the total wealth of the society, the total wealth of these two people has been increased. That is, the increase of wealth of the farmer is greater than the decrease of wealth of the fisher. Should things remain there? Some economists uh, uh, and mathematicians, uh, including Calder and Hicks, 
if you're taking notes, said yes, leave it there. As long as the aggregate uh, uh, wealth of society has been enhanced, we won't get into the details of who gained and who lost. But another mathematician, an economist, Pareto, said, well, we don't really know if the gain of the gainers is greater than the loss of the losers unless and until we require the gainer to compensate the loser. And if the gainer can't do that or is unwilling to do that, it calls into question whether society was really better off. So in that example that I've given you, either there can be a standoff between the farmer and the fisherman, or the farmer can say, I will compensate the fisherman for the loss of the fish in the stream, and I will still have enough net profit to make the investment in the technology uh, feasible. Now, has the law created this wealth? No. Has the law enabled the process by which the wealth can be created and, uh, and distributed? Yes, it has. Let me give you a, a, um, a real life example, an Idaho case that arose uh, uh, nearly 30 years ago now, with which I had some connection. Um, Carpenter versus Double R Cattle Company. This is a case in which, uh, in western Idaho, a neighborhood had grown up around uh, a relatively small scale livestock operation, but then there was a big investment in the livestock operation, going from a, a, a few dozen head of cattle to more than a thousand. And uh, needless to say, it had a huge impact on aesthetics, on health, on water quality, and so on throughout the neighborhood. And so there was uh, a, a legal action filed. Uh, to uh, either stop this, uh, this expansion or to compensate the neighbors for the adverse economic impact upon them, principally re uh, reflected in property value. The livestock company said, no, you can't stop us. This is a good thing. Society as a whole, our community as a whole is better off. We will employ more people. We will provide more cattle to those people who eat beef. We will pay more taxes. We will enable schools to open and so on. Our utility is greater than your harm. And indeed, under what is sometimes called uh, the first restatement of torts, that was the test for whether either an injunction or damage award could be made when there is a nuisance, that is, an economic activity that imposes an external cost or an external loss on somebody else. So there's the externality. The second restatement uh, came along, and it's a, a restatement is an effort by scholars to distill uh, the patterns of uh, decisions across the country, and said, that's too simplistic. Although utility, when it exceeds the harm, ought to preclude an injunction, we still ought to allow the, the, uh, the activity to go forward because it increases the aggregate wealth of society. But it should pay compensation to those who are substantially harmed. It should internalize that externality. That was a position that the, that the uh, Court of Appeals took in Idaho. The Supreme Court reverted back to the first restatement and said there is no compensation because there is no nuisance and that's because the utility exceeds the harm. Well, which do you think was right? Which do you think was the better decision? Don't talk too quickly, and don't try to guess which side I was on. <laughs> um, what if, if you say, well, we think that that livestock operation ought to pay compensation to those whom it adversely affects. Are you expressing a preference, or are you expressing a principle? If you say you're expressing a principle, would that principle also apply if the externalizing activity was not a stockyard, but a laboratory working on a cure for cancer? and the paying compensation to a group of surrounding landowners would actually cut into or slow down the research at this laboratory. Well, that may make you stop and think about how difficult it is to articulate uh, an enduring and neutral uh, principle. I challenge you, whenever you hear uh, talk about how the law applies, you should ask yourself, is the courts or the legislature, if it's creating law, or the governor in uh, carrying out the law, looking toward a multi-case process with equal application to many cases, including prospective future cases, as opposed to simply trying to achieve a preferred result in one case only. And in the case that we just talked about, should the idea of equity Perhaps the livestock owners are relatively wealthy compared to the surrounding neighborhood. 
should that enter into uh, the, uh, the, the enunciation of, a, of an economic principle? Well, as a result of this very quick tour, we have seen that the enduring principles are necessary to anchor the rule of law against usurpation by the powerful. Even evil persons can have something emanating from the heart and can sincerely believe it. But it is the rule of law that, that constrains them. These principles have to be enunciated and tested in specific cases so that they're not mere abstractions, but they are not limited to those cases. They do not provide, to use a metaphor, a ticket for one train only. They endeavor to balance the stability of the natural law uh, with uh, the dynamism of positive human-made law. They endeavor, to borrow again from the turning of the wheel, to balance centrifugal forces of individual rights with the coalescing and the uh, centripetal uh, forces, that is, the forces that draw inward, uh, that are uh, expressed through community values. And they combine constraints of law with con concepts of justice. These sometimes are inconvenient. Sometimes we just know where justice should take us and the law seems to get in the way. But the law also protects against injustice. As many of you will uh, uh, recall, there's a famous uh, colloquy between uh, Sir Thomas More and his ambitious son-in-law Roper in the play based on the life of Sir Thomas uh, More called A Man for All Seasons, in which the ambitious son-in-law has a very hard-edged notion of justice and thinks that the laws are getting in the way. And more, both an ecclesiastic and a lawyer, is more careful about it. And at one point, the son-in-law says, I'd cut down every law in England to get at the devil. Justice. Oh, says more, and where would you hide when the devil turned round on you, all the laws of England having been laid flat? A similar idea may have been uh, expressed by Shakespeare, uh, who is best known, uh, well, not best known, but well known uh, for uh, the line that is spoken by one of his characters, the first thing we do, we kill all the lawyers. That line, as many of you know, appears in Henry VI, and the statement is issued by Dick the Butcher, who has in mind a scheme to destabilize the province or the kingdom in which uh, the play is set so that he can take over and impose a tyrannical rule, and for that purpose, the first thing we do. Well, the message uh, here, I think, is that we must, in the pursuit of justice, never quite attained, but nobly pursued, nobly undertaken, to marry the impulses of the heart with the rigor of enduring principles. This is a hard work, but it is driven by what George Eliot called something not outside us, but the great yearning within. I encourage all of you, whether you go into law or you go into something else, whether you're on the edges of the law or whether you are personally circumstanced by the law, not to let the inconveniences of the marriage of the mind and the marriage of the heart interfere with the nobility of the effort to achieve that great yearning. Well, thank you very much for inviting me here today. And I think we have a few, uh, a few minutes uh, for questions and, uh, and challenges. Hi. What do you see as uh, any, are there any things going on in our legal system today that make you stay awake at night or worry? And where do you think our country is today in the context of your overview? Well, of course, there are many things that are imperfect. Uh, but I think one thing, again, to draw upon the interdisciplinary nature of this discussion uh, is uh, the uh, propensity um, in the media. Now, the law is not perfect, and so by turning to the media, I don't mean to suggest that uh, one is less perfect than the other. They're both imperfect. They have to be human institutions, after all. But I worry about result-oriented coverage of the work of the ordinary administration of justice. Think about when you read about a Supreme Court opinion, um, do you get 
actual quotations of the explanation of the, by the court of the rule of law upon which the outcome is based? Or do you instead get a, a report of the outcome of the case coupled with interviews and reactions from the stakeholders as to whether they like it or not? And maybe speculation about whether the judge appointed by a certain president or a certain governor uh, was evincing a personal preference. That's not impossible, but it's a lot less likely if the judges are put to the discipline of expressing reasons. And if they express reasons which do have a legitimate connection to the underlying rule of law, then that's what the courts are there to do. I worry that the courts are increasingly viewed as another political branch of government because they are only reported with regard to their results and popular reaction. I do stay up at night worrying about that. I can't. In the case of the, whether the cattle company was a nuisance, uh, are you going to tell us uh, which position you took and how the Supreme Court ultimately ruled? The Court of Appeals on which I sat and I wrote the opinion ruled three to nothing that the second restatement should be adopted which would allow the livestock investment to continue but compensation would have to be paid uh, to the neighboring property owners. The Supreme Court by three to two uh, voted uh, the other way and they have the last word. It sometimes is said that uh, courts at the apex of a court system uh, are, not, uh, are, are not final because they're infallible. They're just infallible because they're final. Uh, out of the eight judges, uh, five saw it uh, one way and three saw it the other, but all three were on the final court. Thank you very much again for letting me join you today.